Jason Pamer, producer of this incredible film, After Death. It is great to have you here on Charisma News to talk about this film, which I had the chance to see the screener of it. And I got to say, the visuals are amazing, uh, better than anything that I've seen when it comes to anybody trying to recreate an afterlife experience. But I got to tell you, the storytelling, the music, and most importantly, the fact that it drives people to have amazing conversations about real life and death situations. Uh, Jason, it's great to be able to have you here on Charisma News to talk about this film. Thanks for having me, John. It's a gift to be here. It's one thing to make a film. It's an entirely uh, more difficult thing to release and find an audience. So without platforms like yours and voices like yours, uh, it wouldn't be worth making anything. So grateful to, that you had me. Well, this film is absolutely worth making. And I love talking about uh, near-death experiences. You know, what happens after we say goodbye to this skin suit um, and our spirit goes on. And uh, I got to say, the people that you've chosen in this film to interview and to highlight and kind of recreate their stories and their experience, um, that had to be quite a process to figure out how do you tell this story but let's back up and say, why tell this story? You know, it was born out of loss and grief for our director, Stephen Gray. He experienced a sudden and catastrophic loss of his brother-in-law. He grew up having a faith, but, you know, when we get confronted with these moments of extreme grief and death, you know, that faith is tested and it was for Stephen. So he, he went on a search, read 30 plus books of people that had done uh, extensive research into NDEs, people that have had them to understand, is it, is there something more verifiable even than just the scriptures I was given? Like, is there, is there some other corroboration that, that exists out there in the medical space specifically? So he vetted a lot of the stories and ended up shooting a short film on Dale Black's story. Dale Black is the commercial pilot who hit a, uh, a, a tower at 135 miles an hour at 70 feet up. Two of his co-pilots died on impact and he, uh, where he died and then, and then came back. And his story is featured in the film. But Steve sent through the short, and to any young filmmaker out there listening, if you want to get the attention of a uh, producer's show, don't tell. And that's what mm -hmm. Steve and Chris did. They sent a short, and it was like, oh, we immediately saw a unique point of view, a distinct vision for the thing. And we're like, these are filmmakers that we want to get behind. One thing that I found uh, as a common thread throughout all the people that you've interviewed – um, and it was done masterfully well. It was uh, the way the lighting and everything looks just amazing. And it's going to be phenomenal on the big screen. So everybody needs to go see it on the big screen. That's really important. But I kept noticing this theme that everybody said that I didn't feel like I had died. I felt like I had uh, that I was more awake. Or I was I was I was alive, and then I was more alive. Nobody said like they they stopped. It was they were alive, and then they were more alive. How do you depict that on on the screen? It's such a good question. You know, it um, the way that they described uh, the afterlife was both enticing and terrifying in terms mm -hmm. of the the challenge it presented as filmmakers. And we we pretty quickly um, determined we didn't want to go with some classic images uh, of heaven felt like that would fall short. So we went a little bit more ethereal and cosmic um, in terms of kind of the textures and the way that we wanted to represent. We wanted to elicit feelings of wonder and mystery and awe. And so that was sort of the, the direction to the VFX team. And, you know, we hired drone ops from around the world. One, one was in Norway and, mm. and got some of the prettiest places on earth. And then with VFX, we combined these realities. And, and in our estimation, this is, what heaven will be like. It's a, it's a, it's a renewing of the thing that we're experiencing here. It's not a completely, it's not a complete going away of the physical. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a maturing. It's a, it's an enlightening of that space. So we wanted to combine those elements and the VFX team did an amazing job. There's most of it's custom VFX throughout the whole film. Very little is actually licensed at all. So hats off to that team, hundreds and hundreds of VFX shots throughout oh the film. Gosh, so yeah. for a documentary, you know, it, I mean, it's very much genre bending, and that's in large part due to the, the amount of VFX and then the cinematic recreations that are a through line as well. Yeah, and these the way that the stories are told 
um, I love how they're they're kind of weaved in and out of each other's stories, and there's there's commonalities that you're seeing. Um, but you don't talk to just people that have had heaven experiences. You also talk to people that have had hellish experiences and how their life has been changed as well. Um, how did you? It's it's horrific and scary and spooky, but it's not like um, it's not like Halloween scary. Uh, if that's what I'm if that's what I'm trying to explain there. Um, yeah. Talk about the, you know, trying to de- trying to depict some of these darker themes. Yeah, so the twenty three percent or so of reported NDEs are hellish experiences. They think the number is higher, but it's it's unreported, and that's right. Probably for obvious reasons, a lot of shame attached to why when I died did I see that version of the afterlife and not you know either nothing or a better version and. Howard Storm in the film and Paul Ojeda and Steve King all share from their hellish experiences. Howard, in, in many ways, is the emotional climax of the film. Oh my as gosh, well. yeah. I mean, it was such a powerful interview. They, they shared so bravely and courageously. And, it, you know, the contrast between what they experienced and then this relentless cosmic pursuit of love. Mm-hmm. To rescue them out of this moment, that 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 tension and living in that contrast to me is where some of the most beautiful moments in the film sit is in those places. And um, it, you know, it was a challenge to depict that because it's so easy to go cheesy and cliche and on the nose. And mm-hmm. we worked really, really hard at not doing that. Make it more terrifying by just sort of a less is more approach. Music really supported it, and. Um, you know, I mean, he, he didn't even in the interview, he probably stopped 30 percent of the way in terms of being able to give the detail because it was mm-hmm. so traumatic what he actually experienced. Howard, that is. Yeah. Now, your role as the producer, you're you're dealing with a lot of the pulling everything together to make this happen and to help the help the director. But you're you're involved with every aspect of it, which is uh, which is, I'm sure, very hands on. You know, how much got left on the cutting room floor that you're like, oh, man, I wish we could just incorporate this uh, because is there an after after death coming after this film? <laughs> because I feel like there's so much more that yeah. I want to see uh, other stories that I've heard that I want to see how your team would visualize this, which on the big screen, it's going to be overwhelming. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for teeing it up, too. We, the, 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 at one point early on in the filmmaking process, we had a vision for a series. Each one of these stories were going to break off into their own episode. That's still very much possible. And depending on how successful opening weekend is and, and the run in theaters, it, it could set us up to go forward and make a series on new stories because it's just it's endless and the appetite for it is there. I mean, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a global question. At, uh, where am I going to go when I die? And so we have desire to, to produce a series. And, um, there is a lot that got left on the cutting room floor. I mean, we ended up shooting for a couple of weeks out of Mexico, 20th century Fox built a lot for the build, the, the making of the Titanic master mm. and commander was shot there. And so that's where we shot all of the narrative recreations. And we used most of that. That was like, we were going to, you know, pull everything we could together and then use as much of that as possible. Um, number of interviews didn't make the final cut, and um, you know I can't even tell you how many terabytes we shot. I mean, probably close to over a hundred terabytes worth of footage. Wow. Um, so quite a bit is there untold in terms of the ongoing sort of medical and scientific discoveries. I mean, even since we locked the cut, there's more and more. So we would like to lean into that um, through a series. I mean, that, that's something where it's like the evidence continues to pile up. Yeah. So if you're interested in, in watching more of this uh, and, you know, number one, go to the big screen, go to the theaters, watch this film. Uh, if you go to angel.com slash charisma, you'll be able to actually uh, get your tickets there. And that actually helps charisma um, as well. It gets, you know, we're, we're teaming up with them to help get this out, which is exciting. And also, if this becomes a success as other things like sound of freedom and the uh, son of God or son of um, his only his son. Only son. That's the, yeah. yeah. Those things became uh, tremendous successes. If this becomes a tremendous success, which we believe that it will, because it is so powerful. 
uh, there can be more and more of this type of, of production, which is going to be just incredible. So I just want to encourage everybody go to angel.com slash charisma to get your tickets and we can, we can make this thing happen and spread it to family and friends because I got to say, Jason, the conversations that are going to happen after this film is over, that is going to be what is what is people what what they take away from this film because you can't leave this film without wondering and questioning yourself yeah i'm i'm i think if, if i was to be most proud of one thing it's that that they're, they're, they're it incites a bigger conversation and introspection of how how do we live here mm-hmm. in light of the hope that eternity is on the other side this is one thing that came out so clearly through Mary Neal. She's a spinal surgeon and died going off of a waterfall and being stuck under it for, she was underwater for somewhere between 25 and 30 minutes. And in her life review, she thought she saw how her life impacted 30 degrees out, not 30 Mm. total people, but 30 degrees out. So John has a brother who has a daughter, who has a friend, who has a mom. And she only knew degrees one and two, but she saw how her life had rippled out that far. Mm-hmm. And it was just this beautiful grace given to her in this moment to have perspective that every choice we make here matters. And I think for those that walk out of the film that maybe don't attach to a faith, that that takeaway, our prayer is that it deeply resonates with every audience member. It's like, hey, the way you interact with the person at the counter, the person at the drive through your kid, your kid's teacher, all of these relationships and opportunities are are ground for exposing people to the eternal love that's chasing them. Mm. And this is what the, 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 the God had essentially told Howard in his life review was like, go back and love. And Howard's like, that's it. And they're like, trust us. That's the most difficult thing to do, but it, it'll be, it'll be the thing that changes everything. And yeah. so that, that's our hope for people coming out of the theater. You know, Jason, I got to ask you some personal questions about love because that is the message that is all throughout this film. How has Jason, uh, how has Jason actually started loving more because of this film and, and who was Jason before the production of this and who is Jason now compared to that? Great question. I think you, you have to ask my wife, my kids and, <laughs> and my, my partners, uh, to see if there's been a change. I hope there has been. I mean, I, I, you know, Mary's, I keep citing Mary's story, but it's just one that Knowing that there's a perspective that I don't have, but someday will come where I can actually get a 360 degree view of, of reality. So, so here to get to your question, I have one more example of Mary's story. She was abused as a young girl. And in mm-hmm. her life review, she saw how the abuser had been abused. And it didn't excuse the abuse, didn't excuse that moment of pain, but it gave her perspective that, you know, hurt people tend to hurt people. And, and so I, I can't, I haven't had a near death experience, but as much as I can live vicariously through those that have and just understand that there is one day going to be given to me a perspective where I can see all these small moments today that feel small, but actually ripple into eternity. So for me, I'm trying to um, be more present in what I perceive to be the mundane, be more active in, in the moments that I feel are just rote and traditional and, and understand that they actually ripple into mm-hmm. eternity. And so, um, you know, if that's spending an extra three minutes on the ground playing dolls with my daughter, um, or if it's, you know, some, somebody, this is a classic example. Somebody cuts me off. I have a traditional response. Um, and maybe I don't lean into that traditional response. Maybe I'm, I'm kinder because maybe they're rushing to get to the thing. Cause they just got the call that, you know what I mean? That's again, one yeah. of those moments where in the life review, you get perspective of all this where we don't have here in the three dimensions. So I think, I just got to keep looking forward and going up one day. I'm going to have access to these moments. Um, and, and I think I'm going to, I just, I just want to be able to look back and smile that I mm. treated these moments well. And I was faithful with stewarding them the well. Yeah. I, I, I I'm sorry. I forget the guys, the gentleman's name that died in France. Um, and Howard, he, you know, Howard, he went yeah. through his, his life review and he says that he, he just, was disappointed in himself. And then it, more so that he was, he knew that he had disappointed Jesus and the angels. Um, and he, you see this emotion in his face that can only come from a pure, pure place, but my goodness, his life was changed. And the things that happened afterwards, 
it was not all sunshine and, and roses. Uh, uh, you know, it was not easy for him, and it's still not diff- not easy for him. No. But he was able to restore some things that had been stolen from him in, in relationship wise. I mean, it's it's remarkable to see how when you get that perspective of somebody's of your own life that you can you have the opportunity to make some changes. Well, that's one of the things that convinced me along the way is these people didn't have a lot of incentive to come back and lie about what they experienced. I mean, Howard's marriage disintegrated, his relationship with his kids soured. Um, And that's the case with many people. I mean, you have like Mary Neal, who is a highly regarded uh, physician. And to come back and say that she experienced all this stuff would, you know, easily categorize her as a quack in many circles. And so a lot of these people did not have the incentive to come back. People kind of tried to attribute well, they wanted to make a lot of money. Well, Don Piper, who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven, waited 15 years yeah. to write the book. So I think that th- there's, there's a went great – severe depression during severe the – Severe depression. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, severe depression. Yeah, that deeply impacted his wife and kids. So it's, it's, there, it's not to say that there aren't people that have hopped into this camp and claimed things that are not true. I think that would be foolish to say that it doesn't exist. And even mm. these authors would say that, you know, they've, they've known people to do that, but the ones we chose in the film were incredibly uh, highly vetted to, to only focus on the cases that were corroborative and are able to be corroborated and had documentation. Like mm. Dale Black's story of hitting that towers in the front of the LA times when it happened right. the next day. Um, medical records, you know, we, we tried to get stories that were as, um, you know, as much detail surrounding it and perspective, multiple perspectives, like in Don Piper's story, he was killed on that bridge being run over by an 18 wheeler. We found the, the officer that was first on site. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think he'd ever been interviewed before, but we found him and he came out to the bridge and recounted how he showed up and it was treated as a death. And, Anyway, so stuff like that, I think, helps, you know? Yeah. Wow. You guys did a very thorough job uh, depicting all of these all of these things. So you kind of feel like it almost blends or blurs the lines between documentary and film, um, which I, I, you know, I, I hope that's what you're going for because that's what you did. And um, my goodness. Uh, yeah, thanks for calling that out. We, 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 you know, that's actually the thing that attracted Stephen Gray, our director, to, to Cypher Studios was he saw our film The Heart of Man, which came out in theaters in 2017. And that was a genre-bending genre film in its own way. And for us, you know, the, the last five years, te- uh, cinematic doc is – or cin- cinematic and doc have become synonymous. You know, mm-hmm. Netflix has created an entire category. Sure. Excellent, yeah. um, you know, unscripted stuff. So we wanted to lean into that and kind of play with the genre a little bit. So the narrative reenactments give us a place to cut to, to sort of help the audience sit in these moments versus just coming from talking head to interesting B roll to talking head. Yeah. Um, So yeah, hopefully it's entertaining. I was just in a theater earlier this week in Utah with a couple hundred people and it's definitely, I mean, it's why we made it, we made it for the theater, you know, finished in Dolby Atmos and, and Mm -hmm. uh, Dolby color and, um, our DP Austin Straub did a fantastic job. I mean, everybody just really leaned in a couple hundred people spent, you know, a couple hundred people over the last five years touched this Mm -hmm. film to make it what it is. So, wow. So this has been, this has been five years in the making. So this is really a a labor of love. And we're recording this in October of 2023. This film is going to be released to the public in just a few days, but during that last five year span, you had to make this during the COVID lockdowns and, and everything that was going on. What were some of the challenges that you guys had to overcome during that? Yeah, I would not m- recommend making a, a film during a pandemic. I mean, we had, Steve had reached out, Steve and Chris reached out to us in 2018 for the first time. And then we tried to take it out to the town as a, as a, as a series. And, and we didn't get a lot of bites on that. So we kind of repackaged it into a feature that took some time. And then we closed the investment early in 2020, January of 2020, hmm. and started and started mapping out production. And then the world shut down. Nobody was traveling. We actually kept a lean crew flying all around the U.S. Uh, through 2020 and 2021. But we had to go to everybody. The, a lot of hmm. these folks in the film are on the older end and are sure. physicians who work at hospitals or colleges or universities, and they didn't want to travel or it was very difficult to, 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 to get anybody to move. So we took a crew everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then it was a matter of where do we do these reenactments? 
and there was a, quite a few uh, barriers and restrictions to shoot here in the U.S. And we found a team through a relationship in Mexico that was like, this is world-class crew. It's an incredible location. We can do everything there. And so we were able to pull that off. And, you know, by God's grace, no one got sick, but we did a ton of travel for – so that took us to 2022. And then post on this, we had many versions of the film, many, mm. many versions, because that thing you called out earlier, the blending or the moving between interview subject and reenactment, it's not clear cut. And it's in many ways more art than science as, yeah. you know, where emotionally do you, do you want to go with this? And how do you tell the whole story without, you know, tipping your hat or forcing it too clearly mm-hmm. in one direction? So we edited it for a year and a half, almost two years. Wow. Um, of editing it. So our, our editor, Sam Benmonte um, from Bruton, just incredible. And, you know, he, we don't share the same faith either. And mm-hmm. that was okay. And in fact, that's the case with many of the people on the project was we just wanted to make the best film. And it was like, what, what is the most compelling way to tell this story? And at the end of the day, I think all of our fingerprints help, help push it that way. Yeah. And you mentioned people having different faiths. I remember the one, the one gentleman um, grew up Buddhist and then he has this experience. He, he kills himself in a horrific way. And then God sends him back and he ends up becoming a chaplain, uh, which is, I mean, that's a, a remarkable uh, thing, but he's, he's able to take his experience and help other people that are going f- through horrific things. Um, and in a way, like he got a totally renewed purpose in life. And I know anytime that you're dealing with, with, um, life and death situations, it does give you a new perspective. Um, you talked about how, how your perspective has changed a little bit during this film. Um, what are some other ways that you're now going to do other productions and other, other projects? And you're going to look at those. How are you going to look forward? And, and this, how is this going to change some of the things that you're planning on doing in the future? Well, I'll say this from uh, been in independent filmmaking for about 15 years and I've never been more excited about the opportunity that exists in a large part due to the disruption of what Angel Studios has been doing in, in the marketplace. You know, they they have a voting body called the Guild and the Guild is made up of around 100,000 people and a subset of that Guild votes on the material. So the exec team at Angel doesn't make decisions on content. The Guild makes the decision. So mm-hmm. And they're uh, fundamentally angels, a tech company. So everything is extremely iterative, a B tested, everything, including content. I mean, we had, I think seven screenings with real live audiences all around the U S and theaters just to determine what is the most impactful way to do the end credits. Mm. So, I mean, everything is tested, 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 which as a filmmaker previously, I would raise money, go underground for two or three years, come back out, hoping that we'd find an audience. So there would be an opportunity mm. to reach an audience. Angel has said like, let's, let's start betting and determining if there's an audience. And if there is an audience, we're going to lean in hard right. and we're going to double click into that. So it's very exciting to be partnered with Angel. I mean, we're, you know, Sound of Freedom was a top 10 all time independent film release and we're the next one up in theaters. And mm. I'll just say this way. They, they have similar goals for the doc um, you know, you don't take a doc to theaters generally. No. You sure don't take it out wide. You know, we're pushing 2,300 screens at the point of this taping, which is a top five all time doc release. So it, it feels very much like, and I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but history in some respect is being made as it relates to the mechanism of release and getting content out to audiences that are there that are hungry for it. I mean, we took this film around early to some streamers in studios who were remain unnamed. Mm-hmm. And they were like, it's a beautiful film, but not large enough of an audience. And right. to their credit, it's a doc. So, I could, you know, but Angel was like, well, let the guild, let the people tell you if there's a large enough audience for it. And there seems to be. Yeah. Well, this film is exciting. My, my wife and I absolutely loved it. And it brought up some really good conversation for people that already love Jesus, but it brought up conversations of loved ones that, that have passed on and what they're experiencing and how this will actually give you hope uh, as you're watching this of, uh, for people that have gone on to be with the Lord and to know that they're in a much, much better place. And as you see these visuals and the descriptions, uh, it's really going to help you kind of 
imagine heaven in a in a new way, in a deeper way than you might have have thought about it before. And the 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 high definition 4K, uh, amazing amazing footage is going to really suck you in. And so I just really want to encourage everybody: go to angel.com/slash charisma to get your tickets, book early, and um, even the the pay it forward, help other people be able to see this film. Because it's going to open up conversations that you then can talk about Jesus so that they can know that they can get through those pearly gates whenever they experience their after death. Jason, Paul, Jason, it's great to have you here on Charisma News to talk about this amazing film. Thank you for making it and bringing attention to this. Thanks for having me and getting, helping us get the word out, John. Appreciate you and Charisma. Absolutely. God bless you. You too. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? This really does show that there is life after death.